Hello and welcome to this NPTEL lecture on this introduction to cultural studies which is the course we are studying and we will continue in this particular lecture with uh, Franz Fanon's Black Skin White Mask which is a text that we are currently examining, currently studying. Uh, so, we are looking at this chapter called the Negro and Language. This is page 25, it should be on your screen and then uh, Fanon in this particular chapter talks about uh, the idea of language and we we just spent some time in the earlier lecture talking about how language is associated with agency and that in turn is associated with identity especially in colonial politics where appropriating a certain kind of language will give you automatic agency, will guarantee you agency etc. However, you know there can also be an idea of over appropriation. So, if the black person speaks French uh, in a very polished sophisticated way that then be that becomes a problem. Uh, and so, the black person is always expected to speak French in a particular way in a very uh, you know fragmented grammatically incorrect erroneous kind of a way because that would fit the bill that would fit the stereotype uh, more conveniently. Now, in this particular page on page 25, uh, Fanon goes on to say to speak a language is to take on a world, a culture. The Antilles Negro who wants to be white uh, will be the whiter as he gains greater mastery of the cultural tool that language is. So, language is quite clearly defined as a cultural tool. Uh, is that kind of an instrument through which you can uh, move up or move down the cultural ladder? Uh, and that obviously is a very material process. So, again we are back to this old argument that we have about culture being an entanglement between materiality and abstraction and language being a, you know, a very good case in point. So, rather more than a year ago in Leon, I remember in a lecture I had drawn a parallel between the Negro and European poetry and a French acquaintance uh, told me enthusiastically, at bottom you are a white man. The fact that I had been able to investigate so interesting a problem that to the white man's language gave me honorary citizenship. So, you know this is a, a dark funny, a dark humorous kind of an example where Fano uh, obviously is being very anecdotal, he speaks from his personal experiences but that is the whole point of this particular book. He will rely on his subjective experiences and he says quite clearly that I do not even aspire to be objective, I do not even aspire to be neutral. So, I will speak for my subject position, I will foreground my subject position and you know therein lies the honesty and clarity of expression uh, of this particular book. So, he recalls a particular experience, a memory where uh, he had delivered a lecture comparing and contrasting you know, poetry written by the African poets and European poetry. Uh, at the end of which uh, a French acquaintance came up to him and said uh, you know supposedly in a very flattering way that you know at bottom at your heart you are a Frenchman, you are a white man. So, the whole point is uh, there is a very easy question over here between sophistication and whiteness, between civilization and whiteness. So, if you are civilized, if you speak a language uh, you know which belongs to the white person in a way which is very sophisticated then you automatically guarantee uh, a metaphorical honorary citizenship. So, you become a French person, a white French person. So, again the question of agency comes in very, very clearly over here. Okay, and then uh, Fano compares this particular episode with an uh, experience which uh, uh, involved the poet Amy Cesar. Uh, so, he says in the end of the, the bottom of this page over here which on the screen, I am reminded uh, of a relevant story. In the election campaign of 1945, Emil Cesar who was seeking uh, a deputy seat addressed a large audience in the boys school in Fort de France. In the middle of his speech a woman fainted. The next year an acquaintance told me about this and commented uh, you know that his language is so powerful and so evocated that you know the woman swooned and fainted in his presence. So, the whole point is uh, you know uh, it is inexplicable, it becomes exotic when a black man speaks a French language in a way which is sophisticated and metaphorical and figuratively rich and so that comes through the sense of a quotient of exoticization, a quotient of glamour, a quotient of otherness which is now you know becoming glamorous. So, you know it becomes doubly exoticized, it becomes doubly, it almost becomes like a magical performance right, uh, something out of the ordinary, something extraordinary, uh, something out of the radar of logic because logically the, the black person is not expected to speak uh, in sophisticated French uh, because sophisticated French belongs in the purview to the purview of the white Frenchman uh, who is civilized by default. So, speaking a black person speaking very polite French, very nice French uh, is almost like a magical performance. In this particular episode a woman faints when she hears Emma Cesar speak in very fluent French is a very good case in point. You know, so the language of the black person, uh, the way the black person appropriates uh, French language becomes almost like a magical performance, something which is so unexpected and extraordinary kind of a way. Okay, um, 
some of the facts are worth a certain amount of attention. Uh, for example, uh, Charles Henri Julian introducing, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a Cesar as a Negro poet with a university degree, or again, quite simply, the expression, a great black poet. So this double qualification is what Fano is uh, pointing us at and uh, you know, directing our attention to. A Negro poet with a university degree, so it's almost like uh, an oxymoron of some kind. A Negro poet with a university degree you know, doesn't exist. So if one exists, uh, if you find someone, that person becomes an extraordinary example. Someone is black at the same time educated with a university degree or a great black poet. <clears throat> so no one would say, uh, Fano would argue, no one would describe anyone as a great white poet because poetry, whiteness, civilization, culture, these are easy questions, these are easy, you know, linearities um, with each other. But, you know, for a person who's black uh, to be a poet and a great poet, uh, that would be an uh, extraordinary example, something which should be pointed out and set, uh, set aside as an offbeat example. So these ready-made phrases, Fanner goes on to say, would seem in a common sense a way to fill a need for Emma Cesar as really black and a poet, have a hidden subtlety. So this is a very, this is what I meant when I mentioned in the last lecture, a good example of covert racism, right, which is something which happens um, quite you know, rampantly in culture where uh, racism is directed not as an explicit category, as an explicit sentence or something which is explicitly aggressive but which might appear uh, in the guise, through the guise of, you know, a very flattering kind of a compliment. But even the compliment could be a covert racist compliment and that would carry connotations of racism. So if someone is being described as a great black poet or a Negro poet who has been to university, uh, which is a supposedly flattering and a compliment, uh, complimentary expression, uh, it actually is racist in disguise because what it actually suggests uh, in a very uh, sort of connotative kind of a way is that black poets cannot be great or uh, black people don't usually have university degrees. So that's the racism over here and Fano is deconstructing that kind of a covert racism uh, to play. So, uh, and then, you know, he goes on to say this, there's a hidden subtlety, a permanent rub in this kind of expressions. I know nothing, Fano would go and say, I know nothing of Saul Poland, except that he writes very interesting books. I have no idea of how Roger Calois is, since the only evidence I have of his existence are the books of his that streak across my horizon. Uh, and let no one accuse me of effective allergies. What I'm trying to say is that there is no reason why André Breton would say of César, here is a black man who handles the French language as no white man today can. So, you know, even something so supposedly flattering, André Breton obviously is a surrealist, yeah, you know, he's one of the uh, biggest figures of surrealism, uh, you know, European surrealism during his day. When he describes M. César as someone who handles the French language in a way that no white man can, uh, that obvi obviously carries a very covert racism in it, which is suggested with the fact that this is extraordinary because a black man is not expected to be a master of the French language. So again, we're back to the question of uh, the relationship between language and agency over here, and to what extent is language related to agency, and to what extent does language make you agentic, and also, and equally interestingly, um, you know, to what extent is language uh, a commodification? So when, he, when a black man uses language, there's an automatic commodification at play over here, which, uh, you know, is there's an automatic expectation, automatic assumption that, that will only be spoken or written in a jittery kind of a language. So when that doesn't happen, when the black man speaks in very sophisticated French, then obviously we have this covert racism, the very, very covert racist rhetoric uh, which comes in uh, in the guise of compliments. Okay, so, uh, so that's the very interesting relationship that Fano draws between uh, language and agency, language and embodiment, and language and cultural identity. So an identity, of course, is part of this entire process. It's the process of becoming, re-becoming, unbecoming, etc. And Fano says, when Fano examines in this particular passages, what extent does language play a role in this process of becoming and unbecoming that constitutes culture and cultural identities? Okay, so now Fano comes to this very interesting chapter, uh, it's chapter four of this book. It's called the so-called dependency complex of colonized people. So this is a very good example of what we mentioned at the very outset when we were reading this particular book, of how Fano is a very good uh, figure who combines uh, psychiatry, combines psychology, combines medicine uh, with racism and looks at the way in which uh, medicine is racialized and how uh, race is medicalized, uh, vice versa. There's this bit of an inter interlocked loop over here which is at play. And he mentions uh, some people, you know, chiefly Octavo Memoni, and he examines and deconstructs this supposed uh, you know, dependency complex 
which is something which is ascribed to the black people. And so the argument is, the overarching um, Eurocentric argument is black people have a natural innate uh, dependency complex or inferiority complex, um, which makes them uh, subservient to the white man. So this is psychologized in a way. So and that obviously is a form of legitimizing um, colonialism. That obviously is a way of legitimizing imperialism and to a certain extent legitimizing racism because what is happening over here is we are mapping out differences in race. We're mapping out race in terms of psychological differences, which is obviously a part of the whole package uh, of you know, discursive formation. So if you make this discursive formations, uh, this mapped discursive formations, what you do essentially is you map out divisions. You map about uh, you know make a neat binary in terms of racialized uh, you know divide. So uh, Fano in this particular chapter is particularly uh, hostile uh, uh, to these kinds of medicalized assumptions and it deconstructs this medical myths uh, that were rampant during his day which uh, sort of empirically prove that the white man uh, is superior and the black man has an innate dependency complex an innate inferiority complex uh, which uh, makes him a natural candidate uh, for you know racism, a natural candidate uh, for being a subject uh, of colonialism, because you know he is weak by default, he is inferior by default, and he expects to be rescued from his inferiority uh, by the presence of the white man, which is a very um, twisted version, really, or an extension to an extent of the white man's burden, uh, which was used as a very clever strategy, a very convenient strategy uh, during Indian imperialism uh, or English imperialism of India where the entire enterprise of imperialism was read or um, interpreted or analyzed as a white man's burden, as something which was sort of noble duty of the white person to go and rescue the Indians who had no civilization prior to the arrival of the British. Okay, so um, Fano goes on to say in this particular chapter, chapter 4, which shall be on his screen highlighted in here, is when I embarked on this study, only a few essays by uh, Manoni published in a magazine called Psyche were available to me. So Octavia Minoni is someone that Fanon draws on quite a bit and obviously critiques uh, extensively because Minoni was someone who systematized this idea of dependency complex. So he, he sort of systematized the idea that the, the African had an innate dependency complex which made him vulnerable, uh, which made him a natural candidate uh, for racism and imperialism. So imperialism was actually part of the rescuing mission uh, for the Africans because they were dependent on the Europeans to come and rescue them. So I was thinking of writing to, Ms. to M. Menoni uh, to ask about the conclusions to which his investigations have led him. Later I learned that he had gathered his reflections in a forthcoming book. It has now been published, Prospero and Calumon, Psychology of Colonization. Uh, and then he goes on to examine it. So this particular book, uh, Prosper on Caliban, is a really important book because it shows us very interestingly how uh, the European idea of uh, superiority was fostered and legitimized by uh, this metaphorical psychological examples where it was sort of proved, quote unquote, or corroborated, quote unquote, how the, the non-European or the African had an innate uh, dependency, uh, a slave mentality, really, uh, which needed a master uh, to control them. Okay, so uh, Fano over here would deconstruct obviously what Manoni is trying to say, uh, and then he moves on uh, very interestingly. And this is a claim that he's making, a very radical claim, I think, uh, on page 63, which should be on the screen, uh, the yellow bit that's highlighted over here, where he makes a very clear statement that I sincerely believe that a subjective experience can be understood by others, and it would be it would give me no pleasure to announce that the uh, black problem is my problem and mine alone and that it's up to me to study it. But it does seem to me that M. Manoni has not tried to feed himself into the despair of the man of color confronting the white man. In this work I have made it a point to convey the misery of the black man, physically and effectively. I have not wished to be objective. Besides, that would be dishonest. It is not possible for me to be objective. So this uh, rejection of objectivity is one of the really radical things about this particular book. I mean, he rejects objectivity and he sort of embraces and celebrates and foregrounds his subjectivity. So he's, he's telling you quite clearly that he is giving this entire account, his delivering this entire account from a very subjective position. And that I think is a very interesting thing to do, to sort of point out the very outset of this particular book, that this is a book about uh, the black experience written by a black person, so it's entirely subjective in quality. Now, when you come to page uh, 65 on your screen, uh, and Fano, and this is obviously highlighted as well, where Fano talks about how uh, you know, Manoni misreads 
uh, colonialism and how this misreading becomes uh, sort of strategic, but also in a way it, it legitimizes, it invests uh, a legitimacy or legitimization uh, to the entire idea of colonialism. And it goes on to say, uh, this is quoting Menoni, Fano is quoting Menoni over here, where he's saying, colonial exp exploitation is not the same as other forms of exploitation, and colonial ra racialism is different from other kinds of racialism. He speaks of phenomenology, of psychoanalysis, of human brotherhood, but we should be happier if these terms are taken on a more concrete quality uh, for him. All forms of exploitation uh, resemble one another. They all seek to serve of the necessity in some edict of biblical nature. All forms of exploitation are identical because all of them are applied against the same object, man. When one tries to examine the structure of this or that form of exploitation from an abstract point of view, one simply turns one's back to the major basic problem, which is that the restoring man to its proper place. So, so Fano makes it very interestingly clear that all forms of um, exploitation uh, are reliant on objectification. So they objectify a man, they reify a man, a certain kind of man. So obviously we're talking about racial difference over here. So a black man over here is objectified and that is how exploitation works. And he says over here that uh, one of the problems uh, of looking at exploitation from an abstract point of view is that you, you do away with this entire basic fundamental idea of restoring man in its proper place. So man over here becomes the subject of exploitation as well as the object of exploitation. And Fano is someone who looks at this process of commodification quite closely. Okay. So uh, what we see over here is a, a clear example of how um, you know the other is created. And we, again, we're back to something which Bhava had already sort of talked to us. And of course, Bhava writes after Fano and it draws on Fano quite a bit, as we have seen. But Fano here makes a very interesting correlation between the black person and the Jew in terms of how both are created as others, uh, others which are to be feared, which are to be, you know, you know, distance uh, from, and that other is created as a strategic position, uh, and compared to which, compared to which the, the white dominant uh, position uh, centralizes itself, or consolidates the centrality, right? So the black person or the Jew becomes uh, the other conveniently. However, there's a difference, if Anna points out quite clearly and quite immediately after this, and he says, um, the black person is more immediately and visually other because of this epidermalization that happens. The epidermalization, of course, is a term that we saw before, uh, especially when we read C. Alden Sadar's introduction to this particular book. And that epidermalization obviously is something to do with the skin color. Uh, the epidermalization, the othering, the process of othering through the skin color. And that becomes visual and immediate when it comes to the black person. Uh, for the Jew, uh, it is not immediately epidermalized. So you can't tell a person whether the person is a Jew or not from the skin color alone. So in that sense, it's less visual, it's less immediate. Uh, so there's a difference, a fundamental, a functional, an ontological difference in terms of the way in which uh, this kind of racism or ethnic hostilities or othering takes place. Although, you know, Fano does compare the Jew to the black person, he also maps out a difference at some point later. Now, he goes on to say quite clearly in page 69, which should be on the screen highlighted in yellow, where he says, the feeling of inferiority of the colonized is the correlative of the European's feeling of superiority. So, uh, you know, this idea of inferiority is a very strategic kind of a construct which consolidates, uh, Fano argues, the European superiority. So the superiority of the European is something which is reliant on this process and projected inferiority, which is a discursive construct. So again, I mean, this is something which Edward Sy talks extensively of in, in Orientalism, where he says that the entire idea of the Orient was the European imagination, was the European fantasy, because they needed an Orient which is exotic and dangerous and hypersexualized and completely different from whatever the Western world stood for. So the point is, the Orient was needed for the Occident to happen, for the Western civilization to assert and reassert its superiority. They needed an inferior, exotic other which was manufactured through fantasy and through discursive strategies, right? So that mm, combination of fantasy and discursive strategies is at work here as well, where again we have the process of othering, which is more of a manufactured product. So there's a production of the other which takes place, and this production relies on discursive strategies and material and markers, as well as a collective fantasy, which is fueled by the materiality and the discursivity. So fantasy is quite clearly over here, that you know, the feeling of inferiority of the colonized is a correlator of the Europeans' feeling of superiority. Let us have the courage to say it outright. 
it is a racist who creates his inferior. So racism requires uh, an inferior other. Racism requires, racism thrives uh, on this division, this hierarchization of races. But, you know, then the whole point is to have a superior race against which uh, an inferior race is pitted against. So this idea of superiority and inferiority is part of this racist program. So it's absolutely essential for racism to map out superiority and inferiority through certain kinds of pseudoscientific methods, to certain kinds of discursive methods which are rampant during any kind of racist control, any kind of imperialist control. Uh, this conclusion brings us back to Saad, and Fana would go on to say, and I quote, so this is Fana quoting Saad, the Jew is one whom other men consider a Jew. That is a simple truth from which we must start. It is the anti-Semite who makes a Jew. So the Jew over here becomes not just an ethnic quality, an ethnic category, but actually a discursive construct. And this discursive formation happens to racism. This discursive formation happens, is, is part of the production uh, of culture. And again, this is one theme, one particular issue that I've been highlighting since the very beginning of this particular course, how culture operates as a process of production, right? So cultural identities over here are also the part of the process of production. So the Jew becomes a part of this produced identity, which is produced again through an entanglement of material and abstract processes, ideological, discursive and material processes, which includes economy, which includes language, which includes religion, which includes a whole host of other attributes, right? So this correlation between the Semite, uh, between the Jew and the black person over here is interesting because both um, uh, are victims, uh, both are sufferers of the subjugation, both are sufferers of this objectification which takes place, which uh, is designed uh, to instill or project inferiority uh, on the Jew or the black person, uh, compared to which uh, the white Christian superiority would be reconsolidated or reaffirmed ad infinitum. Okay, uh, and now he comes to a very real example on page 72 which should be on the screen uh, how this entire idea of uh, imperialism and, and, and Madagascar uh, how did that create a dent a psychological dent uh, in the original inhabitants minds uh, as a result of which um, you know it was an act of epistemic violence as well as psychological violence because the entire idea of torture and subjugation and control of a particular race systematic control of a particular race by another race will obviously have a psychological replications psychological fallouts which is what happened so we are. And it goes on to say in page 72, what M. Manoni has forgotten is that the Malagasy alone no longer exists. He has forgotten that the Malagasy exists with the European. So the original inhabitant of Madagascar uh, doesn't exist anymore. He exists only as a competitive construct, uh, as a relative construct uh, in relation uh, to the white person. Right? And again, the white person over here becomes a central benchmark over here, uh, a centralized benchmark, if you will, uh, against which the non-white person is compared. Uh, and obviously the comparison is strategic because it's designed uh, to reveal, designed to sort of exhibit the non-white person as an inferior signifier over here. Okay. So the arrival of the white man in Madagascar shattered not only its horizons, but a psychological mechanism. So, you know, again, we are back uh, to this really original bit of this particular book, looking at the violence uh, which happens in imperialism and colonialism and racism, not just as a material phenomena, uh, you know, breaking of buildings, taking over of territories, etc., but also as a, as a deep ingrained psychological phenomena. Uh, so this happens at a very deep embodied level. So violence over here becomes an embodied activity, an embodied experience. So the experientiality of violence uh, takes place to an epistemic as well as an embodied level. So the psychological mechanism which are associated with racism, uh, associated with imperialism, uh, you know, is something that uh, are something the Fano examines quite closely over here. So as everyone has pointed out, alterity for the black man is not the black but the white man. Right? So alterity is otherness. So the otherness for the black man is the white man. Uh, an island like Madagascar invaded overnight by pioneers of civilization, even if those pioneers conducted themselves as well as they knew how, suffered the loss of this basic structure. Uh, so this whole, whole idea of the white man being the pioneers of civilization is of course part of the process uh, through which othering happens. So we have the civilized uh, white men coming in and taking over the territory, uh, so territorializing this whole idea of Madagascar and in the process uh, producing the other, uh, the uncivilized original inhabitants of Madagascar. M. Benoni himself furthermore says as much, and I, he, you know, found a quotes Benoni over here, the petty kings were all very anxious to get possession of a white man. 
So again, this is uh, the idea of the dependency complex that uh, Manoni theorizes, where he says quite clearly that the petty people of Madagascar were delighted to have a white man, to have white men come and rule them, because that was part of the psychological makeup. The psychological makeup is such, they're hardwired to be dependent, they're hardwired cognitively, psychologically, uh, to rely on a superior civilization to control them, to rescue them, uh, to redeem them uh, from the ignorance and depravity and lack of civilization. So this is obviously a very convenient strategy of looking at racism and imperialism where you can make the argument uh, compellingly enough uh, by saying that you know, the black people did not know how to control themselves, the black people did not know how to govern themselves. So they're very delighted when the white men came in and took over the kingdom, took over the territory because that's exactly what they wanted psychologically. Right, so the petty kings were all very anxious to get possession of a white man. So the white man over here was a prized possession uh, who came in and rescued them of uh, depravity. Explain that as one may in terms of magical totemic patterns uh, of a need for contact with an awesome god, uh, of his proof of a system of dependency, the fact still remains that something new had come into being on that island and that it had to be reckoned with. Uh, otherwise, the analysis is condemned to falsehood, to absurdity, to nullity. Uh, a new element is having been introduced, having been introduced, it became mandatory to seek to understand the new relationships. So obviously with the arrival of the white people, uh, there were new kinds of interactional relationships which were produced in the particular island. Uh, so the idea of dependency is obviously nonsense, it is obviously part of this mechanism of uh, psychological control. But Fano looks beyond it and says that you know, the arrival of the white man uh, reconfigured uh, the, the human relationships on that particular island, uh, re hierarchized uh, the human relationships on that particular island. So, and it goes on to say, the landing of the white man on Madagascar inflicted injury without measure. Uh, the consequences of that eruption of Europeans onto Madagascar was, were not psychological alone, since as every authority has observed, uh, there are inner relationships between consciousness and a social context. So, uh, the whole idea, this, this is basically summing up what we have been talking about in terms of culture. This interactions, inner relationships between uh, consciousness, which is inward, inside you, and social context. So consciousness or embodiment is basically an interactional activity. Uh, it's an, uh, so embodiment over here becomes an interactional activity to which you navigate with the material surroundings, to which you navigate with your environment. An environment obviously can be ideological environment, can be cultural environment, can be material environment, but it's a process of interaction, it's a process of navigation which creates consciousness. And obviously with the arrival of the white man, the entire environment changes uh, economically, culturally, linguistically, discursively, religiously as well in Madagascar. And that obviously has replications on the psychological makeup of the people who had to retune themselves very quickly with the new environment which had arrived with imperialism. So, uh, and then Fana would go on to say again, looking at this, uh, this is page 73 on his screen, looking at the sort of relativistic kind of an idea of identity where he says, and this is highlighted in yellow, if he's a Malagasy, it is because the white man has come. And if at a certain stage he has been led to ask himself whether he's indeed a man, it is because his reality as a man has been challenged. So, you know, this entire idea of ontological oneness, so you are one person, you're a human being, uh, you know, that is challenged by the arrival of the white man because the white man comes and erases away not just the history and culture of the non-white population before the arrival of the white man, but also the sense of self-esteem of the non-white population because the non-white people are made to feel inferior through discursive strategies. Uh, and that's why the question is also whether they are men in the first place compared to the grand uh, appearance of the white man who is almost given a deified quality, a godlike quality over here. Okay, in other words, I begin to suffer from not being a white man to the degree that a white man imposes discrimination on me, makes me a colonized native, robs me of all worth, all individuality, tells me I'm a parasite on the world, that I bring myself uh, as quickly as possible into step with the white world, that I'm a brute beast, that my people and I are like a walking dung heap that disgustingly fertilizes sweet sugarcane and silky cotton that I have no use in the world. So this whole idea of inferiority is projected in very graphic details so here by dehumanizing the, the black population. That's one of the early strategies of imperialism and racism, to dehumanize the non-white people, to tell them, to convince them uh, through material, linguistic, discursive processes, and sometimes religious processes as well, uh, convince them that they are not human beings in the first place. They are beasts of the lowest order. 
And it's only by interacting with the white man, it's only by aspiring to be the white man, can they redeem themselves as human beings, can they become human beings in the first place, right? So if you look at the description over here, I'm a brute beast that my people and I are like walking dung heap that disgustingly fertilizes sweet sugarcane and silky cotton and that I have no use in the world. So I'm completely useless, I'm completely a trash, a waste of a human being. And in order to become a usable, uh, a sophisticated human being, it is absolutely imperative that I interact with the white man, aspire to be the white man. Okay. Then I will quite simply try to make myself white. So again, we're back into saying that white and black over here are not just skin colors. They become discursive locations. They become uh, locations in privilege. So the white obviously carries more privilege than the black over here. And that's epidermized privilege. There's a process of epidermalization which is happening over here. But um, that epidermalization is part of the discursive process. So white and black are not just ethnic qualities or ethnic categories over here, but they are discursive categories which are quite clearly mapped out in terms of privilege. So I will try simply try to make myself white. That is, I will compel the white man to acknowledge that I am human. But M. Manoni will counter, you cannot do it because in your depths there is a dependency complex. So this is a complex that Manoni theorizes and uh, that theorization is critiqued by Fanon, rejected by Fanon completely. And he says this idea of this dependency complex is a pseudo-scientific complex which is devised in order to legitimize the white man's control over the non-white man. So what we're seeing over here is a critique of a certain kind of psychological study, a certain kind of uh, pseudo-scientific psychology which uh, corroborates, approves, quote unquote, proves uh, this inferiority of the, of the black man and an innate dependency complex of the black man which actually makes imperialism or colonialism as a, as a great grand mission because then that completely satisfies the dependency complex of the black man uh, you know, as theorized by Menoni. And this obviously is critiqued and rejected and deconstructed by Fanon as he examines it uh, very brilliantly and provocatively. So we'll stop here today and we'll continue with this analysis in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.